All right, in this lecture, we want to continue to consider the modes of affirmation in theology, such as how we say that God loves versus that he is angry. This lecture is somewhat a transition lecture. It expects that you've already listened to the introduction to modes of affirmation, which I called God is love versus God has wrath, introduction to modes of affirmation. And this lecture also prepares the way for a much deeper analysis of these various modes of affirmation, particularly comparing and contrasting their different weightage in theology. Uh, in a future lecture, we're going to really concretely evaluate the difference between saying that God loves versus that he is angry and other propositions like this, which is really one of the most important tasks we can do in theology uh, beyond the mere bald assertion, if you like, of these various predicates of God. So we want to do that extensively in the next lecture. But here, we want to expand and deepen the modes of affirmation in a preparatory way, particularly as Thomas himself has explained them together with his respective examples of these modes. And we're going to consider here three modes of affirmation, the paraphrastic, the causal, and the comparative modes, how something is said of God. We already introduced the causal and comparative in the last lecture. Here, the paraphrastic mode is new. There's always more to the story in theology. But these three modes, together with the fourth mode, i.e. the formal mode, which is involved when we say, for example, that God is wise, all four of these together, Thomas evaluates concretely in five extended and very deep and difficult texts, which we want to consider in the next lecture. So we want to prepare for that by deepening our grasp here, also introducing the paraphrastic mode, which is quite important to theology and also is something that we will uh, compare and contrast its weightage or the grade of these various affirmative names uh, in theology. All right, then, uh, first the paraphrastic mode, which is new, then more on the causal, and then the comparative mode. By the way, these are listed in order of least to greatest. Uh, paraphrastic, causal, comparative, with then the formal mode on top, the greatest mode of affirmation in theology, uh, where we say, again, God is wise, good, etc., uh, although not in the same way in which Socrates is wise, good, and so on. That's where we begin to get into analogy of attribution and such like. First of all, then, as we begin the paraphrastic mode. We want to take a moment and introduce this paraphrastic mode, uh, also because it's somewhat less common and more difficult. You should be coming uh, more used to thinking in these kinds of ways in theology. Perhaps as you started out listening to the last lecture and we introduced the formal mode, which is how we say the Socrates is wise, i.e. because he has wisdom. Uh, we spent a little bit of time on that and perhaps you somewhat rolled your eyes because it was native and intuitive to how you think. Nonetheless, as we proceeded, uh, hopefully you began to see that this basic way of affirming, which most people mean uh, when they make affirmations of predicates of subjects in their day to day, uh, becomes really important to understand exactly what we're doing, particularly as we begin to add on more and more and particularly less and less amounts of kinds of affirmation, the comparative mode the causal mode, and then again here, finally, at the very, very bottom of the wall, the mode that we call the paraphrastic. We call it the paraphrastic mode because it paraphrases a negation as an affirmation. It paraphrases a negation as an affirmation. For example, this that God is, is not foolish is paraphrased as this, that he is wise. God is not foolish. We paraphrase as that he is wise. Thomas 
would call it the negative mode because it involves division, namely God is not foolish. Or perhaps he would call it the privative mode because it divides something real, i.e. foolishness in creatures. We could also call it the dissimilar mode because it uses disanalogy of proportionality. So the reverse of analogy of proportionality, disanalogy of proportionality, just as a foolish man, dissimilarly God. We also sometimes call this mode proceeding through mode of contrary form because this kind of affirmation says that something is the form which is contrary to the form which is privated thereof. For example, something is hot because it's not cold, or again, God is wise because he is not foolish. This paraphrastic mode is not infrequent in theology. For example, the proposition that God is simple uses this negative or privative mode of affirmation because God is simple, not because he has simplicity as if simplicity were a form just as wisdom is a form, but rather because God does not have composition, particularly that real composition of essay and essentia, as Thomas would say, being and essence, which is found in creatures. In all modes, Thomas says, in all modes, i.e. all those modes of real composition, this that God is simple is to be held. Thomas continues, and he's explaining the fact that for every question whose respective predicate handles a different kind of real composition, we want to survey all the real kinds of composition with us and among creatures of matter and form, of essentia and essay, et cetera. For every question whose subject is God, where we're involving these predicates, real kinds of composition, Thomas says, the negative part of contradiction is to be held, non-est, God is not, we divide. And each of the truths of these negations is then said paraphrastically through affirming the contrary formality of simplicity. Or all of the truths of these negations are said through omnino simplex, altogether simple. Hence, Thomas says, quote, because God is nowise composed, it happens that he's altogether simple, he concludes. This, that God is simple, uses the paraphrastic mode of affirmation. Another example, another example in theology, again, uh, we use the paraphrastic mode of affirmation rather frequently. Another example is this, that the father has power or is strong, habit potentium or est potens. The father has power or is strong. This is something we say in Trinitarian theology, particularly in appropriation. This proposition uses the dissimilar or decomparative mode as we've already outlined. Recall that, as Thomas says, we can manifest a divine person through either comparing or contrasting, i.e., either using analogy or disanalogy of proportionality. We take something that's essential and we compare and contrast it to a divine person according to their uh, distinct and constituting property, paternity on the part of the father. In the former mode, namely where we're comparing, Thomas calls this proceeding through way of similitude, we would say, for example, that the sun has those which pertain to intellect. I'm quoting Thomas here. We'd say this because the things that pertain to intellect are similar to the sun who proceeds through mode of intellect, just as an intelligible word proceeds from intellection or understanding in our created intellect. Whereas 
In the latter mode, using disanalogy of proportionality, which Thomas calls proceeding through way of dissimilitude, we say this, that the father is powerful, potence, as potence. Why do we say that the father is powerful? Well, we don't mean that he's powerful. Rather, quote from Thomas, quote, as Augustine says, because with us fathers on account of old age customarily are weak, therefore we say that the father is strong. What is the reason, again, of this, that the father is strong? It's not because he's strong, but rather because he is not weak, just as is proper or distinctive to a father among creatures. In other words, the father, because he is dissimilar to a creaturely father who is weak, is strong. The father, the eternal father of the son, because he is dissimilar to a creaturely father who is weak, is strong. Hence, we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Uh, I've been quoting here from Thomas, ST1Q39A7, Respondeo, which is one of the places where Thomas handles appropriation and this, again, way of dissimilitude, uh, which we use in theology. Other examples of the periphrastic mode of affirmation are also found in Holy Scripture, particularly in Old Testament writings, wherein God is contrasted with the gods. Old Testament writings where God is contrasted with the gods. Not infrequently, these writings are proceeding through mode of contrary form. This is how we describe this uh, in theology. For example, when this, that God is slow to anger, is said, long of nose, when we say God is slow to anger, its sense is that God is dissimilar to the gods who are short-fused, as we would say today. And for this reason, that's the important part, for this reason, i.e. because he's dissimilar, because he's not short-fused, so it is to be said that he is slow to anger. The reason of the affirmation is the negation. Especially in such Old Testament writings, because their theology is older and less mature, many divine names have as their reasons also these less mature reasons or more partial reasons. They are some reason of the truth rather than the whole reason, as Thomas would say in De Veritate Q2, for example. It is Although these kinds of predicates could be said because of greater reasons, nonetheless, these writings say them of God insofar as he contrasts with the gods. And therefore, the actual senses in these writings are to be understood as paraphrastic. Again, if you start looking at the Old Testament writings, particularly you're going to find paraphrastic mode is used a lot of the time. Yahweh is all over the place in the Hebrew scriptures, being contrasted with the gods. And for the simple fact that he's contrasted with the gods, we therefore assemble a line of predicates which are being said of him. For what reason? Well, because he doesn't have the contrary predicates that the gods have. He's not like to speak of the Roman gods, Mars, the god of war, who is short of fuse and ready to lash out at people. Rather, because God is dissimilar to this, therefore, it is to be said he is long of nose or slow to anger. As noted, we call this mode paraphrastic because negation is paraphrased as some affirmation. Negation is is paraphrased as some affirmation. Thomas himself would call this the negative or perhaps privative mode. 
He says explicitly that it is through mode of negation, for example, in uh, De Potentia Q7A5. And although this mode is somewhat less common in Thomas, at least in highly explicit fashion, and for this reason, he doesn't really have these kinds of stock examples that we've seen in the case of other modes of affirmation, like the formal, wise, good, et aliuhis modi, the metaphorical or the comparative, rock, lion, etc., or wrath, uh, misery, misericordia, et cetera, these types of stock predicates. Thomas doesn't really have those for this privative or paraphrastic mode. Nonetheless, as you scour Thomas's work, you eventually discover that there are two. There are two that he will use, and uh, these are the ones that I want you to consider as our stock examples, namely the propositions that God is intelligent and that God is wise. God is intelligent and that God is wise. Um, these two kinds of propositions correspond to material and disordered realities being privated respectively. Recall, as I mentioned to you, underneath the comparative mode, we had two kinds of comparative predicates, which is why we have two stock examples. Predicates which involve similitude of being or essence or form, rock, line, etc. Or predicates which involve similitude or are on account of similitude of work or effect, work, opus, or effect. And these are wrath, misericordia, or pity, and so on and so forth. Similarly here, God is intelligent, represents privating, or as an example, rather, of privating merely material realities, whereas wise here represents privating disordered realities. So this, that God is intelligent, is because he is not brutish. Thomas says he doesn't have that mode of being how brutes exist, or um, dumb am animals, we might say, dogs and cats. On the other hand, He's wise. Why is he wise? Well, speaking merely because a uh, paraphrastic reason, God is wise, i.e. because he's not foolish. Again, you hear this is a disordered reality, a disordered aspect of reality that we are privating. Thomas says, quote, that defect which is in those lacking wisdom, i.e. their foolishness. So God is intelligent because he's not a dumb animal, so to say. He doesn't have that mode of being. He's wise. Why is he wise? Well, speaking merely according to the paraphrastic mode, God is wise because he's not foolish. Two important notes about this paraphrastic mode. A first is that similar to the comparative mode, which we noted last time, the paraphrastic mode involves propria. Again, go consult Aristotle, book five of the topics. It involves propria or properties, i.e. distinctive or unique features. Risibility is a proprium of man, a distinctive feature that uh, distinguishes him from all others, uh, namely because he is able to laugh or has the, uh, the power to laugh. This paraphrastic mode involves properties, i.e. distinctive features. In negative theology, we private real creaturely forms through privation of each of which we more and more distinguish God from all others. This is where we are doing the scholastic version of the holiness of God. God is altogether other. He is altogether distinguished from others, and we accomplish or enact this distinction in our intellects. We make God holy. We sanctify the names of God by flagging these properties of creatures, these distinctively creaturely properties or features, and we negate or private them of God. We speak of this as privation rather than merely negation, because the things privated are real, 
being or real aspects of being. So we private real creaturely forms in negative theology. Sometimes, sometimes we then say upon these privations that God, because such and such privation is that contrary form to the thing privated. This affirmation is paraphrastic mode. So we say something is hot because it's not cold. We say that God is wise because he's not foolish. After we've privated something, sometimes we come along the backside and we perceive through mode of contrary form. We paraphrastically say this by affirming for the reason of the negation, contrary form. Thomas does this in various places. Again, when you start looking, the paraphrastic mode of affirmation is actually rather frequent in theology. He does this in various places. For example, SCG 1, C14. SCG 1, C14, this is where Thomas is beginning uh, the SCG. And he says, just FYI, we're going to be proceeding through mode of negation, and we're going to be doing a lot of negative theology, and it's fitting for us to do negative theology. And then he has some explanation about the very basic ways we do negative theology. He says, quote, we say this, that God is not an accident. And through this privation, he is distinguished from all accidents, close quote. Whereupon God, because he is not an accident, is a substance. Because he is not an accident, is a substance. Again, what is the reason that he's a substance? Well, here, it's only because he's not an accident. Note this very clearly. This is so important. You need to understand this. When we say here that God is a substance... We're not saying this because he subsists, which is a reason that we say elsewhere. For example, Thomas De Potentia Q1 A1 Respondeo says, we posit substance in God, we say God is a substance, in reason of subsisting, not in reason of substanding, i.e., we say that God is a substance because he subsists. It's not what we're speaking of here. We're doing paraphrastic mode of affirmation. Here we are saying he is a substance merely because he's not an accident, merely because he is not an accident. Hence, the sense is that God is similar to substances insofar as he is dissimilar to accidents. And he is among substances insofar as he and they are distinguished from accidents. Similarly, Thomas goes on, quote, we add that God is not a body. And through this privation, we distinguish him even from some substances, distinguish him from some substances, Whereas before we were uniting him to all substances, ipso facto that we distinguished him from all accidents. And again, here, when we say this negation, God is not a body, we now can say for this reason that he, because this reason is immaterial or an immaterial substance. In that mode, Thomas summarizes, and in order of creaturely realities, God, through negations of this sort, is distinguished from everything in that, in that each is beyond him, and then, and then only, will be had propria consideratio, propria consideratio, distinctive or unique consideration about his substance. After we have privated all the distinctively creaturely forms, is why we often begin with negative theology, uh, when we're doing doctrine of God, after that, we're actually now enabled to have distinct consideration of what God is. Quote, Thomas says, because God is being known now as from all distinct, as from all distinct, because we have 
privated so many propria or properties, as many creatures as there are from God. Holy Scripture, of course, is doing this frequently. For example, Numbers 23, 19. God is not as a man that he changes, i.e., God does not change just as is proper or distinctive to a man. This procedure through negative differences, Thomas calls it, per differentias negativas, uh, this procedure through these negative properties is considering the dissimilitudes in creatures, not their similitudes. The dissimilitudes or dissimilarities in creatures, not their similitudes. Recall that Thomas says, quote, God with all simultaneously has similitude and dissimilitude. He's taking this from Dionysius, who says, quote, the same created realities are similar and dissimilar to God. This is in Divine Names, chapter 9, and the Thomas quotation uh, is in uh, SCG 1, C 29, of course, where Thomas speaks of uh, similarity in theology. God, with all, simultaneously has dissimilitude and similitude. These dissimilitudes... We flag in theology, this is where we make God holy. Also, these dissimilitudes, Holy Scripture also flags in various places, such as, again, Numbers 23, 19. And once again, relevant for us here, upon these dissimilitudes, we sometimes predicate the contrary forms of God, saying, for example, that God is dissimilar to a stone and therefore similar to animate realities, that he is dissimilar to plants and so similar to intelligent animate realities, and so on. This is what Thomas is very frequently doing and is something we'll see when he talks about the paraphrastic mode of affirmation in those five important texts throughout the whole corpus of Thomas Aquinas where he compares and contrasts these four modes of affirmation, paraphrastic, causal, comparative, formal, which we'll handle next time. A second important note about this mode, this paraphrastic mode, is that this mode involves the via remaciones, the path of remotion, often called today the way of removal, somewhat misleadingly, uh, but nonetheless. The via remotion is the path of remotion, sometimes called the way of removal. As we'll see in the next lecture, Thomas says that we say, for example, that God is intelligent, ipso facto this, that he is not material. Just as we say that something is one, ipso facto, that it is not divided. The affirmation only is insofar as something from negation follows. Thomas uses the example of intelligence because, as he will often say, the negating itself of matter is the very cause itself of intelligence, whose sign is that in the process of our coming to know, material forms are made actually intelligible ipso facto this, that they are being removed from matter. Quote, freedom from material is cause of intellectuality, whose sign is that material forms are effected intelligible in act through this, that they are abstracted from material and from material conditions. Close quote. This is Thomas S. Uh, Thomas C. T. Compendium Theology One C. Twenty Eight. Freedom from material is cause of intellectuality. Again, Thomas does this paraphrastic mode of affirmation in various places. For example, I sent D eight Q one A one ad four, a very important text of Thomas early in his career. So important, quote: 
when we are proceeding into God through path of remotion, Thomas says, quote, firstly, we negate corporeals from him, saying, for example, that he's not inanimate just as a stone, whereupon we can paraphrastically say that he is animate or among the animate realities. And then, for example, we go on, we say that he's not a sensory knower just as a plant, whereupon, again, paraphrastically, we can say that he's among these certain animate realities, i.e. intellectual knowers over here. But then, quote, secondly, Thomas says, quote, we negate even intellectuals from him. Note, as he will say, clarifying, this is very important, we'll consider this later, this negating of intellectuals is only intellectuals insofar as they are found in creatures, i.e. this goodness and this wisdom. This is where we say that God is not good, God is not wise, i.e. insofar as this goodness and this wisdom are found participated in creatures in a shrunken down form in creatures. This, again, does not negate the fact that God is wise, is good. It's merely reflecting Thomas will say, I sent D2Q1 A3 Respondeo, handling the opinion of Maimonides and Avicenna. It's merely reflecting the fact that God, although he is wise, just as Socrates is wise, nonetheless, the mode how Socrates is wise is altogether dissimilar or too small to grasp comprehensively the mode in which God is wise. God is not among those who are intellectual insofar as their concrete goodnesses and their concrete wisdoms are considered. Again, we will consider this at another point. All right, this is enough to at least introduce the paraphrastic mode. Once again, we are introducing it here because in the next lecture, we're going to go really deep and compare and contrast all four of these modes together and show what we do in theology. This brings us to our second main point today, namely the causal mode. The causal mode. We've already introduced this causal mode in a prior lecture. Here we want to expand it and also consider Thomas's explanation and examples. The causal mode. Recall that in the last lecture we used the creaturely example of this, that the sun grows leaves. The sun grows leaves. Thomas's stock example is this. Medicine is healthy. Medicine is healthy. What is the mode? How this, that medicine and healthy is. What is the mode? How this that medicine and healthy is, quote, quomodo sit verum quad dicator, quad, which is a quotation from quad libital 4, Q9, A3, respondeo. What is the mode how this, that medicine is healthy is? Well, medicine is healthy, not of course because it has health, but because it makes someone to be healthy. This affirmation, recall, is causal mode. And just as a little bit of review from our lecture last time, you heard me just now flag the false cause, flag the false cause. Recall, always when we're handling either the causal or the comparative modes of affirmation, and especially in theology where people get so confused, you always got to flag the false cause and then find the true cause. So medicine is healthy, not, of course, because it has health, flagging the false cause, but because it makes someone to be healthy. This is the true cause, the true reason of this, that medicine and healthy has been said. This affirmation is, of course, causal mode. Flag the false cause, find the true cause, uh, just as we spoke of last time. As we noted before, this causal mode always involves another than the subject always involves another than the subject, another whereof the predicate is said formally. 
medicine is healthy because it makes someone formally have health. Similarly, the sun grows leaves because it makes a tree formally grow leaves. Notably, because this causal mode involves predicating something of another formally, for example, a man is healthy, and because this causal mode also says something per posterius, i.e. medicine is healthy, for these reasons, Thomas will sometimes say that this causal mode is less true, less true than the formal mode. Quote, what is said of something formally belongs to it more truly than what is said of something causally. Just as this, that an animal is healthy, is more true than this, that medicine is healthy. Close quote. That's Thomas de Malo, Q1A5, Objection 8. What is said of something formally belongs to it more truly than what is said of something causally. For example, that an animal is healthy is more true than this, that medicine is healthy. Here, of course, true doesn't contrast with false. Rather, the causal mode is less true than the formal mode only because the different foundations in reality, the fundamenta in re, or the different modes of verification involved with either kind of affirmation. Recall, as I flagged for you in last lecture, this is somewhat similar to how Thomas says the comparative mode doesn't say something truly, but only metaphorically. And I perhaps shocked you all when I said, remember the letters of Holy Scripture very rarely say something of God truly. Very rarely are the letters of Holy Scripture actually true. Truth is said in many modes. Here we're saying it contrasts not to false. Of course, all letters of Holy Scripture return the truth, but rather in contrast to metaphorical. Most importantly, saying that the causal mode is less true, or more precisely, is less truly is equivalent to saying that the causal mode has a lesser reason of truth, a lesser reason of truth, whereas the formal mode, in contrast, has a greater reason of truth, a greater reason of truth. It's this lesser reason, greater reason, which makes for the more and less in theology. God is more love less angry because the lesser reason involved when we say that God is angry, i.e. because he's similar to an angry man in that he punishes from justice. Yeah. Lesser reason, smaller reason, smaller contribution to our theology, smaller amount, so to say, than the formal mode that God is love because he actually has love. You got to start to flag these lesser and greater modes, these lesser and greater truths, as Thomas describes them, because this is where we intensify the goodness of God. We intensify the goodness of God and we say God as greatly and as much as can be said. This is our task in theology. It's not only to bring all of the perfections of God into view from reflection upon the perfections with us among creatures but to grade them according to more or less so that our overall image or output in our knowledge of God is most similar to who God is, who is always greater. That's always the task. God is always greater. You can never overshoot the goodness of God. So the comparative mode, Thomas's stock creaturely example as we've said, is the fact that medicine is healthy. His stock divine example is this, that God is our hope. God is our hope. Again, we ask, what reason is it that this, that God is our hope, is? What reason is it that this, 
God is our hope is, it's not because God is that very hope through which we hope, here I'm flagging our false cause, rather it's because he somehow makes us to hope. He somehow makes us to hope. Similarly, Thomas says in I sent D18 Q1 A5 Respondeo, God is our wisdom causally because through this wisdom is effected in us. Excuse me, I've misquoted. Because through his wisdom is effected in us our wisdom, exemplated from his wisdom, through which wisdom in us we are wise formally. End quote. Very important quotation. I'll read it for you again. God is our wisdom causally because through his wisdom is effected or caused in us our wisdom exemplated from his wisdom through which wisdom in us we are wise formally. Again, I sent D18 Q1 A5 Respondeo. Indeed, this causal sense is not infrequently found in Holy Scripture and also is more common in patristic and especially Greek tradition. At least in my experience, it seems to me that the Greeks really liked, particularly the Greek fathers, really liked this causal mode. You really have to watch out for it when you're reading them. And as a rough rule of thumb, the more and more uh, late you go in Latin tradition, particularly in scholastic Latin tradition, the less and less causal uh, reason of divine names is going to be employed. Uh, in Thomas, you have it a fair amount, but when you get to the early modern period, particularly, it almost entirely dies out, uh, almost entirely is gone. Again, just a very broad rule of thumb, uh, a word from my experience of reading the tradition. In the Fathers, you find this a lot. Thomas, you find this a lot. With scripture, you find this a lot. And then kind of less and less as the Latin tradition goes on, particularly in the early modern period. Uh, among the Reformed Orthodox, for example, I mean, you just, you just aren't finding it. An example, though, here, um, Thomas notes that these, that God is delectable, Delectio or caritas, these are two different kinds, types of love. God is delectio or caritas. They are, quote, not only causally, just as these that he is our hope or patience are said only causally. Rather, God is delectio or caritas. These are formal modes of affirmation. Yes, okay. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Thomas says, Authors of those writings which are enclosed in Holy Scripture sometimes intended these names, Delectio and Caritas, he intended these names causally, not formally, causally. God makes someone to have Delectio, again, a type of love. God makes someone to have Caritas. At least, this is the reading of Holy Dionysius, as Thomas explains, Dionysius, quote, questioned what the editors of Holy Scripture, whom he calls theologians, intended to signify when they named God Delectio and Amor, as, for example, is clear in 1 John, God is Caritas, close quote. He questioned what did they want to signify when they ascribed these names, these predicates, they made these propositions in their intellect, and then they signified these propositions in outer word, namely the writings of Holy Scripture. What did they want to say? Well, according to Dionysius, these sacred authors intended these names causally. Quote, these, that God is a more and delectio, are said causally, i.e., God is a more, God has love, because he is cause of a more love, inasmuch as he incends love into others and in a certain mode in them begets love according to a certain likeness. Close quote. This is 
uh, Thomas Dionysius, uh, this is Thomas commentary on Dionysius divine names, C4, Lectio 11, Lectio 11. Again, the quotation here, quote, these that God is a more and delectio are said causally in Holy Scripture, i.e. God is a more is love because he is cause of a more love inasmuch as he incends love into others and in a certain mode in them begets love according to a certain likeness, close quote. In 1 John 4, 8, for example, then, this that God is love is not because God is love. Rather, it's because he makes someone to love, as is clear because this proposition that God is love is the cause of the prior clause. Namely, he that does not love does not know God, i.e. because God is love, i.e. because God makes someone from this, that they know God, he makes them to love. God makes someone from this, that they know him, to love. This is the sense, according to Dionysius, according to Thomas of 1 John 4, 8. God is love. As noted, this causal mode is somewhat more common among especially Greek fathers, again, at least as has appeared to me. For example, its usage occasioned a famous doubt, which Thomas handles in the end of SCG 1 C 26. SCG 1 C 26. Dionysius said, that God is being itself through which every creature is, being itself through which every creature is, something which Dionysius intended, Thomas flags, obviously not formally, because God is not that very active being, actus ascendi itself, through which each creature is. Rather, he meant it causally, because God exemplates that being through which each is. Quote, when Dionysius said that divinity is the very being of all, Thomas explains, he shows that from God in all, a certain similitude of divine being is found. Close quote. And indeed, it is found formally. What is he talking about here? Well, He's talking about that first effect of God, which is essay, as is said in Liber de Causes, Proposition 4. However, Thomas says, these sayings and name are more to be exposited than extended. More to be exposited than extended. Explain them, don't repeat them. People get confused. This is why they had this massive doubt. They're reading the works of Dionysius for the first time, and Thomas, who was a master reader of Dionysius, knew Dionysius perhaps better than anybody else, certainly his theology better than anybody else in his time, is saying, look, Dionysius wrote something that was true, but on the surface, it was confusing, and therefore it's occasioned misunderstanding. These kinds of sayings and names are more to be exposited than extended. We do not extend sayings like God's own being is that through which each creature is. That's pantheism. We don't say that. So what Thomas is dealing with in SCG 1C26, where he raises this doubt, God is not formally that very being itself through which each creature is. Rather, we expound these statements. For example, we say instead that each creature is through its own act of being, which is in it formally, which is similar to that being or essay, which is in God formally. We make those kinds of moves so that people are, uh, well, at least less confused. Nonetheless, although such sayings and names of ours are more to be exposited than extended, Thomas says, Holy Scripture sometimes does say this. Holy Scripture sometimes does say these kinds of things. For example, the famous 1 Corinthians 15, 
God is all in all. God is all in all. I told you this causal mode is found in Holy Scripture all over the place. God is all in all. Quote, God is all in all causally, i.e. he is all perfections in all beings, although nothing of those which are in created realities is he essentially or formally, Thomas says. And thus, whatever existing in created realities is known either by our intellect or by our sense or by whatsoever of the aforementioned modes in all these is known in a certain mode, God as cause. God as cause. We can know God from all creatures, close quote. Or as Thomas explains in earlier passage from Dionysius, this is all from his commentary on the divine names, quote, Thomas says, quote, all are around the first cause as if they derive from it according to a certain similitude. And all are segregated from it, just as from a cause for which all are, just as from a principle from which all flow out, just as from an end which they all achieve. And this first cause in this mode is all in all, inasmuch as every perfection of all creatures is God his very self causally, according to the elocution for this is written in 1 Corinthians 15, close quote. God is all in all. Quote, every perfection of all creatures is God his very self, causally, according to the elocution, for it is written 1 Corinthians 15. This causal mode of affirmation indeed is used somewhat extensively in theology. Still another example, I'm just trying to exercise you here. Another example here is Thomas's exposition of Dionysius. God, uh, uh, Thomas notes, God is time of those which become, i.e. time causally. He is essay in all in whatsoever mode existing i.e. essay causally. Again, we're reminded of that doubt of some who misread Thomas, which Thomas, uh, someone who misread Dionysius, which Thomas just handled above in SCG 1 C 29. He continues, quote, God is the very generation in all in whatsoever mode they are generated, i.e. generation causally because he bestows generation to all. You hear the causal reason? Because God bestows generation to all, i.e. he makes some to be generated, as is said in Isaiah 66, close quote. And then, here's the zinger, quote, and not only the very existence themselves are caused by God, not only the very beings themselves are caused by God, but even whatsoever are in those existence, for example, parts, natural properties, and those which in a certain mode either in here like accidents or substand like substances, close quote, whereupon again, God is all in all, i.e. is all perfections in all beings, i.e. causally, causally. God is all in all. In other words, he is all perfections in all beings. What is the reason? Of this that has just been said, that God is all perfections in all beings? Not formally. It's heresy. Don't say that. Or it's severe. Well, it was declared a heresy, a Lateran four with Amaricus, but nonetheless, it's a significant error, not formally, causally. It's pantheism. That's why it would be, uh, you know, participating in heresy in some mode. A very, very bad thing to do. Good. All right, that's a little bit more on, again, this causal mode. We're trying to expand our understanding here. We're preparing to drill down deep and compare various names of God that we say in theology. I, I mean, I've been comparing and contrasting all the way through here, but we want to do this very, very deeply so that we can maximally make God great. This brings us now to our third and final point for today, 
somewhat more briefly here, the comparative mode. The comparative mode. As we noted in the last lecture, Thomas handles the comparative mode under many names and uses many examples. We flagged that his stock creaturely example is this, that a field laughs, that a field laughs, where expropriating from the very laughing of a man the flowering of a field is said to be the laughing of the field, but not except metaphorically, Thomas says. Not except metaphorically. This is Thomas, I sent D22, Q1, A2, objection three. We also flagged in the last lecture that throughout his opera, Thomas has two sets of stock divine examples, two sets of stock divine examples, which exemplify respectively similitude of essence or form and similitude of work or effect. We had Lapis Leo at Ali Modi, Rock, Lion, etc., and then Ira, Misericordia, etc. We had Wrath, Mercy, i.e. Pity. Recall I told you when you see Misericordia or mercy in lines like this, it's not mercy. It's pity, compassion, or what we would call today sympathy. That's the reality that we're speaking of, sympathy. Uh, God has these on account of similitude of work because just as a man possessed of such passions, whether wrath or sympathy, behaves in a certain manner, so God, when he behaves in that manner, therefore takes on these names uh, affirmatively in the comparative mode. So these two sets of stock divine example, the former rock, lion, etc. Thomas handles in many places. Its first occurrence is in I sent D4 Q1 A1 Respondeo. I sent D4 Q1 A1 Respondeo, where Thomas contrasts the comparative and the formal modes whose difference, he says, is founded or grounded upon those principles, those creatures whence divine name is being taken. It's very important, very, very important indeed. Quote, if the name is imposed to God from that which is of imperfection in the creature, for example, the names rock and lion, then it is said of God symbolically or metaphorically, whereas if the name is imposed to God from that which is of perfection, then it is said properly of God, although according to a more eminent mode. Uh, close quote. And again, that is Thomas, I sent D4Q1A1 respondeo. Thomas, of course, continues this position throughout his life. For example, ST1, Q13, A6, objection two, names such, such as Lapis Leo, Etwius Modi, Rock Lion, etc., from creatures translated into God are said per Prius of creatures and of God. Close quote. Thomas also flags that Holy Scripture often uses these names. Quote, in Holy Scripture, God sometimes is signified metaphorically through lapis, a rock, sometimes through Leo, a stone, sometimes through soul, a sun, at Alihismodi, or something else of this sort, close quote. That is uh, Thomas ST3, Q60A5, Objection 1. And also that the comparative mode, he says, and its metaphorical names, they were the subject of Dionysius's famous last lost treatise, quote, wherein, Thomas says, wherein Dionysius exposits names which are said of God symbolically, think, for example, that he is Leo, Lapis, Ignis, et Alihus Modi, Lion, Rock, Fire, etc. This book, however, we do not have, close quote. Similarly, the latter stock examples, wrath, mercy, or pity, 
and so on, Thomas handles variously. For example, although, quote, God punishes without anger and relieves the suffering of misery without the passion of misericordia, nonetheless, quote, from this that he punishes, we posit wrath in God, although wrath is a passion, and similarly from this that he spares, this that he is merciful ought to be said, although misericordia in us is passion. Close quote. I.e., God is angered when he punishes, is merciful when he helps, not formally, but comparatively. Not formally, flag the false cause, comparatively. In I sent D22 Q1A2, very important text, we find a more extended explanation of this comparative mode, also contrasting with the formal mode. We will, in a later lecture, consider this authority more extensively. But Thomas there, again, gives examples, both of the similitude of work and effect and the similitude of essence and form. Recall these two different kinds of similitude that we handle in theology proper. This time, though, he replaces his standard wrath, mercy, and so on with sentire, videre, et quis modi. Uh, feeling, seeing, uh, sensing, feeling, and others of that sort. These are actions instead of the principles of action, wrath, pity, or sympathy, and so on but he still retains the lapis leo uh, stock examples that he always uses. Uh, this is a little bit of a lengthy quotation here. It's a few lines, but listen as I read, quote, those names which are imposed to God for signifying some perfection exemplated from God, such that they include in their signification imperfect mode of participating, imperfect mode of participating. These names are said of God in no mode properly. But nevertheless, in reason of that perfection that they do have, they can be said of God metaphorically. For example, sentire, videre, et huis modi, sensing or feeling, seeing, etc. And similarly is about all other corporeal forms. For example, lapis, leo, et huis modi, rock, lion, etc. For all are imposed to signify corporeal forms according to a determined mode of participating, being, or living, or something of divine perfections. They are determined, contracted, truncated, imperfect modes of participating being. And when we consider this imperfection and ascribe them to God, who has no imperfection at all, therefore in no mode can they be said properly, i.e. formally, rather metaphorically or comparatively. Again, we note this basic principle, so important to compare and contrast comparative and formal mode. You should be sensitive to the fact that this is really going to do a lot of work in our theology to distinguish very clearly from these two kinds of affirmation, comparative versus formal. Basic principle, when the divine name is expropriated from something that includes imperfection, we use the comparative mode. When the divine name is expropriated from something that does not include imperfection, we use the formal mode. Again, you can go read, I sent D22Q1A2, where Thomas speaks of this more extensively. We'll also discuss this uh, more uh, at another time. Uh, there in that uh, response, Thomas is contrasting this with uh, Anselm's famous simple perfections, which guess what? Are wisdom, goodness, and so on. This is where you start to see the patterns in theology and you begin to really make gains. Again, we'll consider this further at another time. One further final note, and then we'll close. Similar to the mode, how the causal kind of affirmation signifies only relations of causality. It only signifies relations of causality. Thomas will call these habitudes, which is 
somewhat synonymous to relaciones in Latin. Thomas will try and help you distinguish from what he's talking about by using what are basically synonyms in distinct ways and context to help you know what he's thinking. So he uses habitudes here. Uh, for example, in I sent D18Q1A5 respondeo. So similar to the, that, how the causal mode only signifies relations of causality. The comparative mode also signifies only relations of similarity or similitudes, Thomas says, similitudes, i.e. those relations which are involved in the analogies of proportionality, which we're doing in our intellect, handling these metaphorical names. Uh, looking here at, for example, ST1, Q13A6, Respondeo, these comparative names of God, Thomas says, quote, signify nothing else except similitudes to such creatures. Nothing else except similitudes to such creatures. He continues, because just as laughing said of a field signifies nothing else except that a field has itself in beauty when it flowers, similarly to or just as a man has himself when he laughs, according to similitude of proportion, i.e. the similarity involved in analogy proportionality. And in that mode, Thomas continues, in that mode, the name lion said of God signifies nothing else except that God has himself such that he ferociously works in his works, similarly to or just as a lion does in his, close quote. The name lion, which is said of God, signifies nothing else except a similitude because God bears himself, conducts himself, holds himself ferociously when he works or operates in his activities in the world, similarly to how a lion acts ferociously or powerfully or strongly uh, in his. Because both these relations arise from real causality, especially efficient causality. Sometimes these two modes, comparative and causal, are confused and not infrequently are they found together. You're, you're going to just want to flag this away in your head because you're going to come across it a lot. Hence, for example, even Thomas in I sent D2Q1A3 Respondeo places the comparative mode under the causal, okay? I've tried not to confuse you too much by giving you a really clear grading system, which is true and of course representative of Thomas's thought, but just flag away in your mind that because of this overlap, there's a little bit of overlap here in the giving of reasons. They are distinct, very distinct. Nonetheless, they go together, just flag that. One signifies the causal relation, Another signifies the similarity relation, which happens upon the exchange of efficient causality, because omne agens agis sibi simile, every agent, when it acts, operates in such a way that the effect is similar to it. Omne agens agis sibi simile. I don't need to remind you as we close that again, relations, just as negations, do not posit something in God. Do not posit something in God. Quote, Thomas says, concerning those names which are said of God negatively or which signify relation of him to a creature, namely relative names, which are involved in the causal mode and comparative mode of affirmation, concerning these two names, kinds of names, it is clear that in no mode do they signify God's substance or what he is or who he is. Rather, they signify the removing of something from him, we're speaking of negative names, or the relation of him to another, or actually the relation of something to him, close quote. They signify, Albertus Magnus would say, the drawing away or the drawing nigh of creatures. This is why, again, in causal and comparative mode, we always, not partially, but totally negate the predicate involved. And so then affirm it because of either a causal or comparative reason. God has wrath. No wise because he has wrath. He gives his zero wrath. 
but rather because when he works punishment in the world, he conducts himself or he has conducted himself similar to a man who is gripped by anger and therefore punishes. All right, we can bring this to a close. Here in this lecture, we have uh, introduced and explained a little bit the periphrastic mode. We've expanded the causal and then the comparative mode, primarily from Thomas. We've done so pulling the last lecture a little bit forward, handling these modes of affirmation, and then particularly in preparation for the upcoming lecture, where we'll really drill down deep and evaluate the various kinds of names based upon these various kinds of reasons of saying these names in theology proper, where we say, for example, the difference between that God has love versus that he has wrath. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks so much.